Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. DiscerningHearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the missionaries of charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome again, Father Haggerty. Thank you, Chris. I'm glad to be back. I'm so glad that you compiled for us this wonderful work, St. John of the Cross, a master of contemplation. It's because of chapters like chapter 13, in which you bring forward an important teaching that comes from, as you said, a a letter that may not be as well known that was written by St. John of the Cross, but it contains a very important truth, a really important thing that we need to contemplate in our prayer life, doesn't it? Well, it's a remarkable letter that was written uh, two and a half years before he died. He did die young at 49 years old. Uh And most of the letters of John of the Cross did not survive, in part probably because of the Spanish Inquisition uh, going on at that time, and perhaps suspicions about people who were pursuing more serious interior lives of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila also had that problem in her life. And this letter is written to an anonymous friar of the Carmelites. And it's not that long, maybe three pages in the collected works of St. John of the Cross, but it's remarkable as a treatise on the nature of the will and what the will must observe in a sense in its life of pursuit of God. And some of it has a background in what we have talked about already, that Thomistic understanding of the will having three operations, the operation of desire, our will and desire, and what we all know, our will secondly choosing when we make an act of will, a choice for something, and then also the will undergoing a third operation of delight, some satiation when we are able to choose something and then receive a satisfaction in a choice, the will undergoes a certain delight in that. So this is the background in in a sense for what St. John of the Cross does in this letter. And it's amazing too, because he, of course, he wrote before we had computers. And if he just wrote this out, it's, it's quite amazing to me how precise and depth that, that is contained there. In it, there is an expression, as as you have in the book, of the term apophatic, an apophatic theology. And that's a term that so many of us may not be familiar with, but it's one that is important for us to understand at least the context of that term, because we do hear it often in spiritual theology. And apophatic theology is... That predates St. John of the Cross, goes back actually to the fathers of the church, St. Gregory of Nyssa, for instance, and St. Thomas Aquinas will identify the important acknowledgement of apophatic theology. And what they mean by that is that there is an, an aspect of God, despite all we can say and know about him and understand about him, he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ in the incarnation. And we know much of God. We have our faith giving us revealed truths. And God has spoken to us, you know, in his son, Jesus. But apophatic theology is acknowledging the deeper mystery that God is beyond the grasp of our full knowledge. And it's not hard to acknowledge that very easily, that we do all recognize that there is an element of God that not an element, it's the fullness of God. He's 
infinitude in himself of love, of goodness, of beauty, of power. And God's reality is incomprehensible to the smallness of our own intellect. There's a beautiful anecdote told in the life of St. Augustine, who was, of course, one of the great minds of our Catholic tradition and wrote so much about, you know, deep things on the Trinity and other things. And there's a story told that Augustine one time was walking along the northern coast of the Mediterranean, you know, where he lived in Hippo. And he saw a little boy along the shore there who had dug a hole and was taking water from the sea and putting it into the hole. And Augustine said to him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to put the sea into this hole. Augustine said, you're not going to be able to do that. That's a big sea there. You have just a small hole there. And the boy said to him, isn't that what you're trying to do, trying to understand the fullness of God in your small head? And Augustine understood that there was, he had been speaking to an angelic presence in that moment. And that's a, an illustration, perhaps, of what is meant by apophatic theology, the apophatic inability, incapacity of our intellect to grasp this fullness of God in his love, his greatness, his magnitude, you know, so far beyond us. As you point out, St. John's not saying that our experience of the heart of God, that our ability to be able to enter into prayer with God is something that a door that can be closed, essentially. I mean, he's not saying that that's not accessible. It's just, if I'm hearing you right, it's just the fullness of the experience. Well, it's not going to be possible for us. Well, there's another um, point that you're making there in St. John of the Cross strongly. And most of the time, apophatic theology is a reference to the inability of the intellect to grasp God, that he is beyond us. He is transcendent. He goes beyond all that we can say of him. The true reality of God is far beyond what we can know of him. You know, we can say, yes, he is incarnate in Jesus Christ, but the full reality of love present in the man God, you know, Jesus Christ is beyond our intellect's grasp. But there's another element that St. John of the Cross in particular will take up here, which is not simply the incomprehensible infinitude of God beyond our intellect, but that the reality of God too is in the same kind of parallel way, inaccessible in his fullness to our experience of him in our personal relations and, and in prayer. So that if we do have what are experiences of some sort in the encounter with God, the actual reality of God in those experiences is far, far beyond what we may have tasted in some particular experience of him. And this is why he will use the word inaccessible. Not that, I mean, that's a strong word, I think. And in our English language, inaccessible sounds like someone who we can't have any encounter with that person, that he, his, his door is closed, as you said. That's not what he means by it. I think he's using it as a, a parallel to the incomprehensibility of God to the intellect, that he's inaccessible in his fullness of love. You know, we may know his love, but it's so far beyond what we are capable of knowing in this life and experiencing in this life. I think in understanding what St. John is approaching here, it doesn't hurt to take a look again in context. In his time, the spiritual life was very active in this, not only in Spain, but in France and all these other areas where there are a lot of things that were creeping up that could damage the prayer life of so many. I'm thinking of um, things like quietism and different types of spiritual methods that were coming forward that he had to deal with, didn't he? Well, perhaps so. And I'm not sure if he was exposed to so much. I think there was, there was suspicion of interior prayer in that time. And remember, that's the century of the Protestant Reformation. So it was a time of 
caution and certain perhaps anxieties that a Protestant approaches of over subjectivity taking over the realm of prayer. You know, it's much safer to have people praying in common, you know, the Psalms together in a monastic, you know, setting, that seems to be rather safe. But when you have solitary prayer being pursued in a rather intense manner, you know, it's good to know to this day, you know, traditional Carmelite life as part of their rule asks for an hour of mental prayer in the morning, an hour of mental prayer in the late afternoon. And that's a lot of silence and solitude, you know, in prayer. And it doesn't make everyone perhaps a contemplative. There are other conditions for that. But that type of interior approach to prayer, it does have its risks. And John of the Cross would have been writing here. He's trying to refine, to purify, to put people on the right path to the reality of God. And so part of it is what happens with the intellect and faith. And part of this is what happens, what is meant to happen as the will engages itself with God in a a lifetime of an effort of love with God. So the will is part of the impact of our relations with God in prayer. We'll return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty. If I'm hearing you right, Father Haggerty, it's about a disposition of heart. It is how we, a whole person, approaching this relationship and this engagement with God in our prayer. And what I mean by that is that it's a difference between, can I say it, a Marian disposition of whatever the Lord wants to provide, whether it's an experience or something that was very edifying for us in that moment of prayer, or if it's something that is different than that. There might be something that you're not feeling something necessarily or experiencing that. It's to let go of that, to detach from that, and try not to possess it. 
to say that it's mine or to try to retain it or hold on to it. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, and even that's correct, Chris. And I think, but even more so, see, John of the Cross in this letter on the will and before that also, he's going to be stressing that if we arrive at some particular knowledge of God in prayer, that's not the equivalent of taking hold of God himself. And if we study about God, that's not the fullness of the reality of God. He transcends these things that we are grasping in some knowledge, that particular knowledge is not God, and also particular experiences of the will in its satisfaction and the seeming taste of God, that anything particular is not to be equated with the the full experience of God that we hope to have in the next life in the beatific vision and the reality of God, you know, awaits us. So the, the problem in one sense is that we do like to have, you know, satisfying experiences outside of prayer, in prayer, human nature is inclined to pleasure, to satisfaction, to taking hold of in, in possession of something. And the same human element gets into prayer. So we are easily open to approaching prayer as a seeking delights in God. And John of the Cross is um, insisting that we have to have a kind of pure desire for God alone, not to you know have a kind of blank slate on that, that we don't know who he is, but a pure desire for God alone and for his will. And that kind of pure approach to prayer, that nothing in between that is meant to be the destination of our prayer, that we want to always seek for him alone, only God. I want you and you alone. I want your will and that's all. It's a radical approach to prayer, but he's, he's in effect teaching us that this is the contemplative path to God that is part of any serious holiness in life. It really is important, isn't it, that we understand that this is a desire to engage with love at its very heart because God is love. So it is going to be something that draws us. I mean, this is why we do it, to serve love in this opening ourselves up and allowing God this space and what however it may look as we've talked about before contemplation yes it's that time we set aside in the beginnings and just that openness to even that silence but it goes on even more as it becomes an aspect of your whole operating system in life i don't mean it sounds so strange when i say that and you see that played out in the religious life but you also see that in everyday life don't you well, that goes back to the, if we ask, what's the fundamental requirement for the grace of contemplation, beside the fact that it's, you know, God giving this grace, contemplative graces are gratuitous, you know, given by God, but why? The primary explanation, if we want to use that word for why people are granted contemplative graces, is because the will of a human person is truly becoming united more deeply with the will of God, much of which is taking place outside the time of prayer. So the more a person really is giving themselves in their vocation to God, and there's no, no doubt, you know, in religious life, that is a very possible thing to happen if you're living in a good traditional religious life where the vows of chastity, poverty, obedience, sometimes a fourth vow, as in the missionaries of charity with the poor, when these vows are live well, that person is giving themselves very generously in their will to the will of God. So what happens then is almost as though, if we want an image on that, you know, a, a water pipe, a pipe in some manner is being released and there is a flow between the desire of God for that soul and the desire of the soul for God. And the will is, you know, in a sense, turning and being drawn to God because he is drawing it. 
And there is, in the time of, of prayer then, a drawing of God. He's, in a sense, pulling toward the soul, pulling at the soul in its desire for him. And this is taking place then as a kind of undercurrent in prayer. In much of prayer, and Augustine would talk about this in his writings, much of prayer is really an exercise, an exercise in desire. And when contemplative graces are being given, we don't have to even use the word exercise. It's a flow of desire for God in the human person toward God. But this may be taking place as a kind of undercurrent in deeper layers in that cavern of the will, as John of the Cross will speak of this. And the importance of the will is then, is not to get diverted to seeking other things. If we pursue other satisfactions, if we want you know, good feelings in prayer, if we want to feel our love, or we wanna to want to feel loved, if we're seeking secondary things in prayer, we may actually be turning that flow of living water off to a, a rivulet in some manner away from the, the mainstream there, which is God and the will, in a sense, turning to one another. It sounds as though that if the key is what brings me pleasure in my prayer, if that is the first thing, the consistent desire to be able to experience something that gives me satisfaction in my prayer, then that's disordered. The ordered is more that we desire God's will. And so in this time of prayer, that apophatic experience where I may not be feeling anything, but the desire to just be there for him, with him, through him, and whatever that might be. And if I receive, there is something that is experienced. Well, then that's well and good, but that's a secondary thing, correct? Yeah, that would be correct, Chris. And and God's will and God alone, you know, and they're the same thing in a sense. I want what you want. I want you, you alone. That's what I'm seeking. And then we all, we always will have some kind of background awareness that that's not happening fully right now. We can cast ourselves in abandonment toward God, but we're not taking hold of him. And we're not being filled by him in any complete manner, in, you know, yet in this life. We're taking steps day by day toward him. But as you mentioned just initially now, most people who are you know, serious about prayer and about God, they're going to begin. And sometimes people go, we could go a long time in life desiring you know, again and again to have satisfying experiences in prayer because we identify those satisfying experiences with love itself, that we want to experience love. I mean, this is true in marriage. It's true in, in many things, that we want to experience love. The fact of loving is a, an enjoyment. And John of the Cross is he's not warning, but he's identifying that as a, that could be a self-seeking thing. And the reality of prayer is to seek after God, that it's a, a long journey, and to keep our eyes on him, that we want him. And we want to go outside of prayer, you know, desiring to give to him what he is going to ask of us, you know, in any day. To want him and then to go forth into a, a day and to want to be used by him, to bear fruit for him in some manner. So this kind of pure desire for God, no matter what, is brought into prayer. And there, you know, there's no doubt that there's much aridity, difficult, you know, perseverance that must be exercised in prayer. And to let that become more and more a secondary element in prayer, that it's not that important. And the more we take our eyes off of that, perhaps more the reality of God is the real pursuit of prayer and better fruits, you know, then really begin to take place in prayer. Thank you so much, Father Haggerty. I'm so grateful for this conversation. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me and having these conversations with me. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty. 
This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit Ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com And join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty.